Chris Sims and the Longhorns with a first down in the three. They got 206 to work with. There's the blitz. Touchdown, Oklahoma. Williams got him on the blitz. Lehman on the pick. Oh, he's going to win it again. Superman. Yeah, that's what they called him. That safety blitz pretty much ended any hope for Chris Sims and the Texas Longhorns that day. But for OU safety Roy Williams, that single play was about to change everything. No, absolutely not. Abs I mean, this is not the team of the 90s. If Quincy doesn't get cut, I think that I'd probably end up on practice squad, if that was possible. Maybe they cut me and I'm playing for somebody else. I couldn't make myself do it. I was just like, done. We did not want to play. Cleveland didn't want to play. It was a lousy game. She had never played it. He was young. I don't even think he had started school. And he got this dump truck. And back then, they didn't make them plastic. It was metal. I don't know if he thought he could ride it down the stairs, put a puncher in his head, and we had to go to the emergency room. We had to have stitches. But he was, he was a handful. That's why it was like we had to find something to put him in that could corral some of that energy. I played street football probably when I was about five, six years old. And then after my mom was trying to get me into stuff from T-ball, and I never tried soccer, but basketball. I think he fouled out in the first 30 seconds or something. So um, I said, maybe football. I said, just think of it, you can hit people and not get in trouble. I grew up watching um, cowboy football with my dad. And he had a uh, Tony Dorsett jersey um, in his top drawer. And I used to always put it on with a life preserver. I have no clue. I, I, we lived in the hood. And I don't know why I had a life preserver, but I had a life preserver. And so I used to put that on, and I used to put the Tony Dorsett jersey on, and I used to run around the house, running into things, act, act, acting as if there were defenders. And then, you know, I would dive in the end zone, which the end zone was my mom's bed, my mom and dad's bed, and score a touchdown. Early on, Roy was known as the hammer. That's what they call him, the hammer. Uh, because he hit someone and they'd fall over. And he was so uh, excited about knocking this kid over and scoring. And I'm like, you need to go apologize. I said, because to me, if somebody would run him over, I know how I was, because I was such a wimpy mom anyway, um, that I made him go apologize to the little boy. And I'm like, don't you feel better? Hell no, I don't get that. <laughs> I mean, dude, let me tell you something. You walk in between the white lines, anybody is fair game. Anybody can get it. I mean, she was wanting me to have compassion, but I mean, in the sport of football, you don't really have compassion. You have, you have your guys on your side and you're going against the guys on the other side. I mean, it is what it is. Sometimes you have a burning desire in you and uh, football was that for me. I just like to play football. I mean, I, I thought I could do it all. On the, I mean, I played quarterback, I played running back, I played receiver, I played corner. Um, I just, I knew I liked to compete and I just knew I liked just to be able to have a, a group of guys that I, you know, I knew, felt comfortable with, and you can just be yourself. After three years of dominating high school football in California, Roy took his show on the road to the University of Oklahoma. Roy, by far and away, the most versatile player I've ever had. Uh, could play uh, inside at a safety position, could play deep at a safety position, could go in at linebacker. He was a great blitz guy to, to blitz him. So uh, just a really special 
uh, talent to be able to do it all and uh, just had a just had a great feel for all those positions. and we welcome you to the SBC Cotton Bowl, the 66th annual, and the matchup today between the defending national champion Oklahoma Sooners and out of the SEC, the Arkansas Razorbacks. I remember, uh, first of all, watching Roy ahead of the game, thinking, boy, he, he looks bored. You know, this is like, He's grown out of this. This is this isn't enough for him anymore. And and then he goes into the game and terrorizes Arkansas. Keep an eye on that as Jones temporarily escapes trouble and caught from behind by Roy Williams. The junior out of Union City, California, regarded as the top defender in America. Top defender, watch him coming here. He's coming on the blitz, whether it's run or pass. Roy Williams is in the backfield, and here you see his athleticism tackling an extremely fast Matt Jones. Now they're going to want to move Matt Jones. He's not going to want to sit in the pocket. And Oklahoma coming after him. And down he goes. Relentless defense. Guess who? Roy man. Williams. That's his second sack of the day. So you'll see him. I think we held him 50 snaps. We held him to 49 yards, I believe. And I remember one place specifically, they're running an option out to the wide field where Roy is. So he comes up, plays the quarterback. They pitch the ball, and of course, he then runs down the pitch man and for a five yard loss. Look at Roy Williams. Amazing. The nation's top defender, the third award winner, the Bronco Nagurski Award winner, and the two time first team All American makes another play. You're running a trick play at the wrong man. Folks, if you yeah. go with this guy here, look at it. There it is. And he just zeroes in. And look at that. Oh. Well, a lot of Oklahoma fans wondering if this is the final college game for Roy Williams. He says he'll make up his mind at the end of the season. I think he's coming out. really wasn't an easy decision for me. Especially in 2001, I'm leaving guys that are dependent on me to help to help teach them, you know, the ways of to keep this legacy on of great defenses ongoing. Um, and I didn't want to leave my teammates, you know, it's how I remember doing the speech back in Oklahoma after winning the Jim Thorpe freaking crying because it's like, dude, I'm, I can't believe I'm, I'm leaving this family. Like, I mean, it was my family. I'm gonna miss you guys a lot, Coach. I mentioned it to Bob Stoops, Coach Bob, and, um, you know, he said, hey, it's totally fine. We support you a thousand percent. But he said, before you go, you might want to just call the NFL and see where you're projected to go. So. I was like, yes, sir, I would most definitely do that. So we called and they said, we project you top 10. I was like, I'm out. Five days after Roy's final college game, the Dallas Cowboys traveled to beautiful Detroit to tie a bow on a dismal 5-11 and season. That humiliating loss to the Lions was noteworthy in a couple of ways. Number one, it would double the season total wins for Detroit. And two, the Cowboys would have the sixth overall pick in the 2002 draft. Whatever team you're following, if you then watch big college games and bowl games, you always try to figure out how can, how can my team get that guy? Because I don't think there's any others like him, so I want that guy, how can I get that guy? And knowing the Cowboys were up there and that there would be tremendous interest in him anyway because he went to OU, sure, those, those fan fantasies were immediately there. Boy, wouldn't that look good in silver and blue. 
he just jumped off the screen. The way that the, the physicality which he played in, the way he delivered blows, the hits that he made. I mean, guys just stopped in their tracks when the ball went his direction and he would come forward and he'd hit somebody and they're just on the ground. They would stop. There was just no going forward after that. But he was one of the one of the best that I'd ever seen in all my years in the National Football League of delivering that blow and finishing people off. We needed playmakers, and he was one of those kind of guys. He was one of the guys that caused fumbles. He was a guy that uh, intercepted the ball. Well, his physicality stuck out on tape. I mean, he was just an incredibly strong defensive back. I mean, he packed a punch. Uh, he, you know, had strong hands. You know, he was really, uh, you know, he set the, the stage for the game. You know, that's one of the things we always talk about is does a player jump off the tape at you? Those guys are easy to scout with Roy. It was just a matter of not how you were playing. It was just get him and play him. The general consensus was you take a corner that high, you don't take a safety that high. But when I watched him play at Oklahoma and you watched the film, it's really safe to say you never saw a guy hit people as hard as he did. And you know, they say in football, he'll stone you. And, and it seemed like Roy did that two or three times a game where you just drop a guy dead in his tracks and, and just stop whatever momentum he had going in whatever direction he was going in. And the guy just drops like he was hit by a sniper. was officially on the Dallas radar. But the Cowboys, like any NFL team that's about to invest a truckload of cash in a 21-year-old, wanted to know a little bit more. <laughs> I remember meeting with the Cowboys. Um, they had it kind of like a mafia style. I mean, it was a dark room, like one little light on. I mean, I swear it might as well had smoke in there too from people smoking cigars, but I just remember Zim because he was asking me, he was drilling me, you know, all these questions. And um, he was asking me primarily about am I going to um, do everything here. I remember telling him, I was like, yeah, why not? I mean, you know, some people choose not to run their 40s there and they want to run the back after school or feel good, whatever. And I was like, I said, honestly, I was like, sir, I'm here to compete. You know what I mean? I'm fighting for a job, basically. I don't have nothing to hide. Whatever I display is what I display. I mean, I, there's, this is me. You either, you either like me or love it. I'm not gonna, this is who I am. Williams' performance for the mob, along with the strong showing at the Combine, told the Cowboys all they needed to know. Roy was their guy, no doubt about it. Well, either Roy or that kid from Texas. That was the intriguing thing about that. You're not talking about two guys who do the same thing, even though they're both defensive backs. You know, Jammer's, Jammer's an aptly named cornerback. And, and Roy is Roy's a demolition derby. All of that is according to each team and the way they evaluate their own situation as much as the way they evaluate the player. We called the San Diego Chargers. John Butler was the GM in San Diego at the time, and this is before the draft again. And Larry just picked up the phone, Larry Lacewell picked up the phone and hit the button for San Diego. And Lace goes, hey, John, you gonna take Quentin Jammer? And he goes, yeah, we're planning on doing it. And he's like, okay, thanks. And he just hung up the phone and we were all sitting there like, well, I guess they're gonna take Quentin Jammer. But all along it really was. Both players were in the discussions, but again, what we were talking about though, the, how the, the player, this, the, this dynamic rare player with Roy was, was always gonna be our guy. The Dallas Cowboys are on the clock. It was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen in the draft room because 
I, I still to this day say it was one of Jerry's most masterful moments in there of manipulating and creating what happened at the time. So Jerry had Carl Peterson from Kansas City on one line and he had Frank Gilliam from the Vikings on the other. Yeah, boy. Yes, sir. Yes, Carl. Kansas City. Uh, I understand. I understand. Carl, I think we're just uh, locked in here. Now, um, are you going to take Roy Williams? Okay. So you won't take Roy Williams. Uh, let's go. He actually got him to tell us who he was going to draft. And in this 15 minute time period, you know, we realized that we could make a deal with either one of these teams and we were still going to get the guy we wanted a couple of picks later. And back then, there wasn't the pain for the slots as much. So to drop down a couple of picks saved you a lot of money, literally millions of dollars in the signing bonus and how much that guy was going to get, get paid at the time. We were down to the wire. We were trying to make a trade because we had some pretty good intelligence that uh, we might could get Roy a couple slots back. And, uh, but as you do with a last minute trade, you start to run out of time. The way the league works is if Dallas would, if we would have passed, everybody could have run their car to the front. Kansas City could have run their car, Minnesota could have run their car, and everybody's like, Dallas is gonna pass, Dallas, and we were, and we all were like holding our breath. And we finally got it worked out to where it was like, man, we got our deal, and it was just like, there was this sense of relief in the room and, and some general excitement that we knew it was gonna work out in our favor. And then I remember saying, Stephen, you, did you call that in? I remember standing next to Jerry Jones as it got to five, four, three, and he had his arms crossed and we thought we were dead. I was like, dude, what the hell is going on? Like, you know, I was, I was like, I, I might get drafted. I was like, I, mean, I, was, I didn't know what was going on. Stephen Jones immediately dove on the table to the bank of phones that was there and he grabs the receiver and he hits the button to the league office and says, Joel, Dallas has got a trade with Kansas City. If you've ever watched those old movies where they're trying to defuse a bomb and it gets down to three, two, and then they clip the right wire, we clip the right wire. And then I get a call and it's like, hey, we made a couple of moves and um, we're gonna take you at eight. And, um, and then I, I literally, they Paul Tagaboo called my name and and it was like it was like wow. You know what I mean? It was just literally a, a wow moment and you know it was it was cool because um I got to have my family there. You know, my mom was there, my dad was there, my grandpa, my uncle, and then I had some buddies from California that came down and I mean it was so surreal uh, being drafted and and it just going full full circle as far as back when I was in eleventh grade saying I see myself playing for the Dallas Cowboys in five years, and five years hit, and I'm with the Dallas Cowboys. So it worked out pretty good. We got to ride in Jerry's plane. Um, I mean, it was just, I think we were playing cards too. I think we were just trying to calm my nerves, I mean. Um, I just, it was, I mean, I don't even know what to say. It's like, man, I, I got drafted by the team that I always wanted to play for. I literally was a kid living out a dream, and I was just like, this is amazing, you know what I mean? I just I just had fun. Like, I mean, I just, I didn't take anything serious. I was just, let's go play football. I'm gonna put somebody in front of me, let me hit them. So that's how I was. After 21 years of dreaming and about three hours of euphoria, that familiar feeling of uncertainty started to creep in. And just like that, Roy's party was over. I actually got to ride back in the um, private plane, but it was a propeller. And I swear to God, we hit every air pocket or bump we can hit. And it was, I couldn't wait to land with that damn plane. I'd rather just take a bus back. It, it happened so fast. I mean, it was, now you're a cowboy, and it was just a lot of expectations and a lot of family members coming out of the woodworks. And I mean, just all the attention 
that comes with the Cowboys, you know, you you, um, you can't you can't prepare for that. You you truly cannot prepare yourself for that. Along with the sobering realization of accomplishing his lifelong dream, Roy recognized pretty quickly that this wasn't his father's Cowboys. The glory days were gone, and if there was a light at the end of that tunnel, somebody must have blown it out. I don't know that there was a whole lot of pressure on anybody at that time because it just didn't look like we were going to get good real soon. I hate losing, but at the same time, you gotta understand my, my point of view. Being an eight-year-old kid, that's all I envision myself doing is playing for the Dallas Cowboys. Good or bad, I just wanted to play football. And I don't worry about the pressures, you know. I've been having pressure on me ever since I was in college, so I mean, I don't worry about the pressures. But I know it's going to be a new magnitude because it's in the NFL and, you know, every game is going to be, you know, the same competition. But, I mean, that's, that's what I left college for, for a challenge. And, I mean, this is a new challenge for me and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to step to bat. When he came in, he definitely wanted to make his mark on the franchise, and you can tell it by the way he practiced. Um, hitting guys the way that he hit guys in game in practice play. I remember the first time we practiced with full pads, we were going through a little warm-up drill, and it was a small little warm-up tackle. It's just basically you hug each other and you move on. It's like a form-fitting deal. And I was in line with him, and it was the first time he and I almost got into a fight. I didn't know, you know, I knew Roy, but I didn't know Roy, you know, that well at the time and he hits me with his head on my side of my head and I fall, I'm like, I'm, he knocks me down. And I got up and I was ready to fight, man. I was like, look, dude, you gotta, hey, just, this is like form. This is not like a full gold drill. So we, we got into it a little bit then, but he, he only knew one speed. He was just explosive at all times. Roy's ability to bring it was impressive and a lot of fun to watch. But in his early days with the Cowboys, the only thing faster than Roy's game speed was the speed of the game. It was fast forward. It was hella fast. <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness. I mean, it was, I think there was a scene on Hard Knocks when I was, uh, we were playing against the Raiders and I was just like, dude. I'm in the middle, right? Three left down left, three left down left. Three left down left, hey, he switched, he switched. Buzz, buzz, buzz! What is it? Three zone? What is it? Tornado. Roy's too f***ing wide again. Switch, switch! Roy, deep it up! Deep it up! I wanted to call a timeout because I was like, this, hey, slow down. Help me out. Slow down a little bit. But it was, it was fast, man. It was just, it was like, pew, 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 pew. Roy was really aggressive. And it was always attack, attack, attack. And, and I think the one thing that I maybe I brought to him and maybe was Zimmer brought to him was patience and understanding the game and the flow of the game and when to attack, when to be aggressive and when to be patient because you're gonna get some play actions. They're gonna game plan you. By the start of the regular season, the speed of the game had slowed down just enough to show why the Cowboys spent a top 10 pick for Roy Services. And the main factor for that change in velocity wore number 28. Darren Woodson was a huge mentor for Roy and it, it made Roy instantly comfortable out on the field having a veteran like Woody who, you know, in my opinion is a Hall of Famer and be out there to help guide him through his rookie year and, I, and that's probably a really good reason why Roy was so productive. Darren helped get Roy in the right place to make a lot of plays and to be that physical presence that he was. Not only was, was he a gifted athlete, but, but Woody was so smart he could line everybody up. He really took Roy under his wing in Roy's rookie year. 
Roy was able to run up some of those stats, not only because Roy was a good enough player to do that, but because Woody helped put him in the right place and, and took a lot of the pressure off him. We couldn't ask for a better situation uh, as a secondary as a whole than to have somebody like Darren Wilson there um, to, to, to be the leader, to be a mentor, because Woody was so like down to earth that you can go to him and talk to him about anything. I mean, regardless whether you know you didn't understand the play, you didn't understand um, something that happened on the film, um, he was always a sounding board for us. And Woody tried his best to pass on everything that he could to Roy to help Roy become the player that he was. The beauty was he got to be around Darren long enough to to pick up some of his traits about how to be a pro, uh, how to be a, a productive player, and how to be a Pro Bowl safety in the NFL. You know, be number one draft pick starting. How does, how's, it, how's it feel to start? Um, it feels good to start, but I mean, that's I don't even think about it no more. Um, that's that's been over with for a very long time. You know, um, I came to. Uh, realization that I'm not a rookie no more, even though they call me a rookie, but I mean, I got to go in there and step in and don't worry about my, my status as a the number one draft pick, a rookie, or none of that. I got to go out there and uh, do go out and do my, you know what I'm saying? No, I got to know my responsibilities as well as my other teammates around me and go out there and execute. Okay, ready? Look me. Mm. <coughs> Damn, that sucks. You all right? Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm, I don't like Are smoke. Are you guys mad? Just give him a little more stuff. Give him a little smoke. Go ahead, hit me. I can do it. I can handle it. Just hit me. Go ahead, hit me. Just hit, hit me. Go ahead. Okay. Ready? Here we go. He was the sweetest guy in the world. He had the most beautiful smile, and he was the lightheartedest guy in the world. Didn't have a mean bone in his body, but he was just that kid when you were growing up on the playground that you wanted him on your team because if you didn't, somebody was going to go home with a bloody nose. You know, somebody was going to cry, you know, and it's it just because he could bump into you and it would feel like you're getting hit by a, a brick, you know, just because that's, he was just rougher than everybody else. It wasn't part of his nature, but when he was on the football field, he hurt people. Hitting is a main thing in football, and he had that ability. You know, he would he would rock you when he hit you, and he was he was one of those guys that, you know, some guys run four five, but when they get to contact, they're at four eight. You know, he's running four five, and when he got to contact, he was four five. You definitely want to see what he's doing because you know that he's going to try to make a play, but most times you just have to listen for the sound. Once you heard the sound, you know that he hit somebody. Absolutely the hardest hitter I've ever seen. And he could hit you from depth, he could hit you up close. He was a game changer. If you've got a guy that makes hits, that, that make the stadium go ooh, like that, uh, it affects everybody on the field. It affects not only the guys playing around you on your defense, but it affects the guy that got hit and everybody on his team that saw it too. It, it has an impact on the game. It brought fear. I mean, when you when you saw Roy Williams coming at you as a, as a ball carrier, you feared that he was gonna break you in half. He really did. I was head hunting and I, was, I knew I was there because I wanted to knock somebody out. It was a joy to watch him play because I could sit there from afar and go, man, that's, you just, you can't teach some of those things. You just couldn't teach it.
There were so many big hits. Even when I go to sleep sometimes, I, I always think about the big hits sometimes. Even at my age now, I'll think of some of the big hits that I've seen or the ones I've had or whatnot. The one that always stands out to me was we were playing the New York Giants. It was Monty Toomer and it was on their sideline. He caught the ball in the flats and I, I tackle him and I, I mean, I just, just basically gently, I didn't say gently, I put my hands on his back just to make sure he, I, he's tapped down, right? Going back to the huddle and um, he gets up and he pushes me and then, um, and I was like, dude, what the, f like, like, what the heck, you know, <laughs> why are you pushing me? Like, you know, and I told him, I said, dude, I'm gonna F you up. And literally, probably a couple of plays later, I had an opportunity. Uh, Tumor was against Newman on the sideline. I think I was either the half safety or the third. And I run over there and I was like, all I seen was a green light. I don't even care. I was like, I'm, I told him I was gonna get him. I need to be a man of my word. And the Giants quarterback rolls out, throws the ball to Monty Tumor, and Monty gets his feet down. I mean, he kind of caught the ball, but it went off his hands, and I i mean, it was one of those, I mean, I, I teed his ass up real good. And Roy comes from about 10 feet away, and just explodes through a mic. My left foot just, just triggered, and I just, just launched right into his chest, and then went up, you know, and then his helmet almost fell off. I wish it fell off, that would have been an amazing hit. It sounded like, Someone took a Louisville Slugger, the aluminum Louisville Slugger, to a helmet. That's what it sounded like. I just remember the impact and the sound of it, and I saw Armani on the ground. I knew he was done. He was done, done. I put him down for a little bit. I don't know if he came back in the game after that. It was beautiful, man. It was one of the best hits. It's probably the best hit that I've ever seen uh, from a defensive football player. Would he get fined today? Absolutely, he's out. He's getting suspended. He's getting FedEx package the next day for sure. And he may not play the following week. And ESPN will be talking about that hit for two or three weeks straight. Yeah. And I'd be the guy talking about it. <laughs>
obviously could physically tackle uh, with the best of them, but you know the, the unfortunate one I think that really got to his head was the old horse collar rule, and uh, Roy did it better than anybody, and uh, they finally figured out that that technique was uh, usually ended up in a pretty good injury for somebody, and they took that out. Yeah, they're talking taking one of his tackles away, and that's you know, and, and I don't think you know Roy. It, it was it was one of those things with Roy Williams by any means necessary, and he'd always say that, hey, by any means that I. Get him on the ground. However you do it, get him on the ground. And that's the way he's always played the game. And all of a sudden, it just went, no, you can't play it that way anymore. I've been doing that ever since middle school, high school. I mean, I did in college. Yeah, he's been playing that way his whole life. And, you know, it takes away, like, if you're a fastball pitcher and they tell you you can't throw fastballs anymore, it kind of affects how you play the game. And I think that affected him a little bit mentally because he was a tackler that would close space and then he would get the guy down. At the end of the day, our job is to tackle the guy and to get him down by any means necessary within the rules. And all of a sudden, that's been a rule. That was part of the game. It was legal in the game forever that you could reach out and grab a guy Put a guy down and make the tackle. Not trying to hurt the guy, but if a guy got hurt, I mean, we figured out it's just part of the game. So when that became a rule and it became the Roy Williams rule, I think some of that took, took away from some of his aggression. I remember Bill Parcells, he was talking about the days of the strong safety being obsolete, the true strong safety, the in the box strong safety. He said, those days, it's a dying breed. Much like the fullback, the strong safety is a dying breed. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, because the game is changing. The league doesn't want the big hits. They, don't, they want the star players playing on Sundays. The things that were Roy's strengths that were in his wheelhouse slowly were devolved from the game. They took the, the horse collar play away from him, the the helmet to helmet things, the blows to the head, the defenseless player. You know, they emptied Roy's tool belt. And it's not that he wasn't still a very good player after they changed all those rules, but he was not the force that he once was when he came in the league because all the things that he did to affect the way opponents approached him and affect the outcomes of the game. Uh, 90% of them were, were things that they took away from him. If you said, okay, well, Roy, we just want you to be a coverage safety. Well, that's, that's not the essence of why Roy Williams was a great player. It was kind of sad in a way because when he, was going to, when he was going through his Pro Bowl stretch, he was as impressive a player as there was on the defensive side of the ball in the NFL. when uh, the rule came in that you couldn't launch on guys. You know, Darren said to me, uh, I can't play if I can't, you know, lay out on the guy. And I said, well, you have two choices. Either you do it the way the rules say, or you don't play. It's simple, you have no choice in that matter. Well, it was kind of the same with Roy. You know, I would talk to him and I'd say, D Roy, you know, that's the rule. You're gonna have to, you know, have to pay attention to it. If you can't quite get there, then don't get there. You know, you get it some other way. When you have people that are starting to dictate how you play, and I mean, that just, I mean, it just, it's just like, you're basically pulled in the life out of me because you're changing the rules of the game. Same two guys. 
Unbelievable. He just outran him, and Mark Brunel got it out there. That wasn't the strength of his game, but he was a safety, and, and I don't know if it was his responsibility, but he's the last line of defense. And uh, anytime you lose to the Redskins, especially when you feel like you got it in your hands, it's always a disappointment. The Cowboys had a game they were in control of, and they lose it right there at the end. That's the game that I stand that stands out to me when you say, "All right, Roy's not the coverage guy. You gotta you gotta keep him down in the box." For them to have a lead and lose a game in that fashion, you know, with those touchdowns right over the top, that's when things went south for them. I mean, I think they were already going south, but I mean, I think that from a confidence standpoint, from from a fan standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, you know, all those things came to a head after that game, and and and, and things just started going downhill for him. And then I started getting. Oh, all type of stuff from, oh, I can't do this, you can't do that, or you can't cover, you're giving up this. I mean, it's just, that's when it's just like, you know what? That's when I started to like, you know, I just don't, it's not, it's not, it's not fun really. It's starting to get not fun anymore. That on top of the whole dirty player, the horse collar, I mean, it just, it was just too much. What teams started to do to us, they started to, they know in quarters coverage, if the, if the tight end goes vertical and he goes over 10 yards, our rules tell us we have to take the tight end. So Washington did something that was very smart. They ran the tight end up to about 12. So that's actually was Roy's man, would have been Roy's man if, according to our rules. When they ran Santana Moss on a post behind him, Roy just actually recognized the play and saw what happened and came off and was trying to go help out and make a play. But people actually thought, hey, that was Roy's guy and it was Roy's fault. I would never throw my teammates under the bus. I'll, I'll eat it, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? As long as they know that, you know, it was not my fault. And that's why you see the bond between athletes then and now is because we had each other's back. We were a family, you know what I mean? So um, I would never, I mean, he feels bad that, you know, he gave up those plays. And I'm not going to compound that with saying that I was somebody else's fault. I won't even say his name, you know what I mean? There's, I won't, because that's just, we, we got a code. I mean, I'm going to, I always stick to that code. I mean, that's just, it is what it is. Well, you, you talk about in the 70s, like I watched the other day a game where uh, Jack Tatum was playing for the Raiders and he hit Sammy White coming across the middle in the Super Bowl and completely knocked Sammy White's helmet off. Sammy White held on the ball, but Jack Tatum stood over him. Roy Williams could have played in any era. He could have played in the Dick Butkus era in the 60s where players were just, they go to the silence and they just maul him out of bounds. Roy would have been just fine for that. He was a strong safety. It's just the time. His timing, if, if Roy plays in the 70s and 80s, even in the 90s, he's a Hall of Famer. He's probably a first ballot Hall of Famer. If you put him in a position where he can just cut, cut it loose and, and just hit people, I don't think his size would really matter. I think, I've, but I, I just, I don't see him as a, as a safety in today's game unless you just want him to be somebody that comes up and blows people up and then those guys run a, 50-50 chance of getting the flag every time they do it. If that happens nowadays, could he play? Yes. Would he be suspended through throughout the season? <laughs> Absolutely, because, just because of the way he played the game. In the NFL, I, I would either be playing for free or I would have changed professions and been a court manager or something because I I wouldn't be able to last in this. I mean, this is. This is tough. I mean, one, I can't, one, I can't horse collar, and then two, 
um, you know, my tackling style. I mean, I, I used to lead with my forearm because I used to watch Steve Atwater do it. I used to watch Ryan Lott do it. Um, hell, I watched Darren Woodson do it. Um, so I just, I, I wouldn't fit. Hell, I didn't damn near fit when I played. <laughs> they were trying to get me out. So, so yeah, it wouldn't, yeah, I, I, would, I would be playing for free. The way the game is right now and the way the draft has been the last few years, Roy's probably not a top 10 pick anymore. No, uh, he's, he's probably a little later because of all the passing in the game and the way they, you know, the, the game is played with more space. Uh, now, you know, there's more horizontal as well as vertical and the different sets and you're getting the zone reach stuff and all that stuff. And he was an attacker downhill. Um, I think that so he would change a little bit. But I think he could have a spot like on our defense, we'd look at him as, hey, maybe he's a potential will linebacker because as the speed of the game changes, they start moving players down. If you were a safety in college, you move down the linebacker. Linebackers move down to defensive ends, that sort of deal. So he would have a role. It'd probably be a maybe a second round, second to third round pick. Well, I think Bill Parcell said he was a biscuit away from being a linebacker anyway. Uh, you know, he could have probably played linebacker for us in the 4-3 scheme. You know, if you remember, our 4-3 linebackers were small and fast. He probably could have been one of those guys. Uh, and I think the game today, you know, there's people playing 4-3 and the linebackers have to run. You got the big guys up front and uh, I think he would fit. Roy Williams is a football player, damn good football player, and if he came out today, that would somebody'd find a place for him. I guarantee you that because he 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 loved to play, and he and he and he knew how to change games with his ability to hit people. I don't know if it would be safety or linebacker, but I'd find a spot for him.